All I have to say is between Izui and Miku and just the scenes that we witness between them, they are very frightening characters. Izui is more frightening than I think anyone on the Eden inside, mainly because he's physically one of the weaker, but the way he can emotionally and even physically break characters rather than brute force like someone like Hayato, he takes his scalpel and he takes his surgery equipment and he breaks the brain in a surgical way so that people who were going to kill them and were begging to be killed when they lost ended up a puppet that would have to answer every single question. And then you have a character like Miku who apparently isn't physically strong or anything really to write home about, but she can see through all the bullshit. She knows exactly what's happening. She can analyze so correctly that it's impossible to get one past her. So that's interesting. And there's definitely been some mystery surrounding the Demon Lord and how this dude is basically... I mean, I was buying into the fact that he's a human who's manipulating demons in order to, like, conquer the world. But when they kind of, like, break it down, it doesn't make as much sense as I think initially I was thinking because, well, if he is a human, how did he live for so long? His lifespan doesn't match how long apparently he's been around. So when Paula brings up the point of, like, okay, so if we're created generally by the thoughts of humans, what if demons thoughts created him and he's actually one of us just obviously that's how he came to be on their side and that made a lot of sense to me but then Isley seemingly has a different idea and when he whispers in the ear of this one character and says I cracked the mystery I'm generally curious where they're going with that because I honestly have no idea my initial gut reaction was like I wonder if there's going to be a connection to Rin somehow like this dude is connected to Rin in a weird way sibling lost uncle maybe something like that but honestly I have no idea and this has been a show that's really painted these gods as pretty much unbeatable you can literally leave Rin by herself to secure a seal and you know they're not going to be able to do much you have someone like Prontia who I love this trope in anime when you have such a strong willed character that something that should be like a sledgehammer to the face literally unfazes them and they can just one shot you or just like hold you in a chokehold and say, hey, you're going to watch my underlings and see how long it takes for them to be. Oh, look at him. He did it in six hours. That's actually a lot faster than I thought. And even though certain characters like Paula didn't get as much spotlight as I was maybe initially assuming, given the fact that she's not really a fighter like Haito, I guess it kind of does make sense. And I guess she'll be more of a side character, which I guess is to be expected. But seriously, this show is a production masterpiece and I love how for a show that's pretty much dominated by people kicking the shit out of other people I'm so engrossed in the lore of this world and the mystery surrounding both the demon side with someone who probably isn't one of them to then the gods trying to keep things at bay while picking and choosing what to do to help humans like they're not going to go destroy this place because it would cause too much chaos for humans but they're also not going to be opposed if a bunch of humans get killed because of humans fighting humans and things like that. And it's really interesting because I was really interested in what Isley was going to do the most in this episode, mainly because he's a character who's not Hayato, right? He's not going to beat the shit out of this character. So the idea of flashbangs was a pretty interesting one. And I thought poison was something that I could see working, but the idea that he used an aphrodisiac to basically force pleasure on this girl because she has a human brain, even if she is a demon, and we get some great information on how that all works with using the speed running fast forwardness of kind of dropping massive bits of information, giving me some kill a kill recap vibes, which I really love. And seeing the idea of like taking like an infant of a demon and infant of a human and merging it into one new DNA, the fact that he used that, and you know, I was thinking, oh, we're gonna get some episode one little nun situation going on. Nope, it's much worse. And she definitely was going to be begging for death more so than what could have happened to her, similar to that nun in the first episode. And to see the manipulation on the brain, he might be the most frightening character on this side, I honestly think. And then to see Miku, a character who I've been very intrigued what she was going to offer for this show because there's no way you give a character design like that and not have her have some pretty decent spotlight. So what was going to be her quirk? And the way they directed that scene where she was forcing pleasure on the nun and how she was reading the nun's mind basically and could see that she actually was starting to give into that temptation of pleasure, something that she kind of like pushed away from because it's the devil. And it was just so artistically, disgustingly directed in like the best possible way. And the fact that she was able to analyze Rin's situation and to change the stance because Rin was pretty much in formation to one shot that entire fleet. But because of Miku analyzing the situation and breaking away from formation, she no longer could do that as easily. You know, for a side that's kind of been getting their ass handed to them week after week, 
this was kind of like the first time it kind of felt like maybe they were starting to get the one up on the Edenans, but at the same time, it's not like they're going to win probably, but then again, who knows, because it's not like they can just unlock the true demons or anything like that. They don't differentiate between friend and foe, so you do need some intelligent demons, but still. It'll be interesting to see, because in a lot of ways, you would almost think that the heroes that we're following would generally be the antagonists of the protagonists that we'd be following, which would be the demons, because... The way they're going up against such an impossible threat, yet they're our protagonist, is kind of amazing. And honestly, even for fights that may not have stakes for the heroes, so to speak, it's so great to see how they just continue to kick ass and take names. I mean, really, I was pretty confident in this production once we reached episode 2 and seemingly nothing dipped, but to see an episode like this and compare from episode 1 all the way to here... I don't think it's dipped visually. I really don't think there's been a single shot out of these five episodes that I would say, oh, that looks sloppy, that looks boring, that looks plain. The way they constantly shift colors around, the fact that there's always something happening, I think one of my favorite shots in this episode was when Isley was talking and the ceiling fan was rotating and the shadow when it went over his face changed the color of his character model. It's just like those little artistic details that you don't see too much of, especially in a show that's as colorful as this. Often they would just keep it as the same color design for all the characters and they would change up the backgrounds. But like everything's always shifting around and the artistic nature of this show makes it entertaining and a 10 out of 10 watch for me. But like the way the gods, the demons, and the mystery surrounding the world is happening, even though you know who's probably going to win every single time, there's a bigger mystery that's such a big curveball that you don't know when something truly unexpected could happen and maybe we will lose a character in a way we don't see coming. And also, I can't be the only one who loves how every single week when they start up the episode, they have those like multitude of circles that will kind of like move around and then it will start up the episode. The way they do filters and transitions is another really cool production detail that really they didn't need to go as far into as they did. They could have just done some standard like static shots or something like that. And we would have been like, I mean, the animation's so cool. So who really gives a damn if the transitions aren't that interesting? But everything about this, like the team behind this must be incredibly stacked. I really haven't looked too deeply into animators and things like that. But I mean, the quality speaks for itself. And seriously, is going to be, I think, one of the easiest to recommend MAPPA shows hands down. And to show that I think maybe... There is going to be a decent amount of people sleeping on it this season, but are going to pick it up probably next season or early next year and going to say, holy shit, how did I not see this earlier? I think this show is incredibly entertaining. It's one of this season's most entertaining hands down, and I think will be probably one of the easiest recommendations of 2021 for anime. It's just such an easy to watch show. And even though there are some disturbing scenes in it, I mean, this show is just way too fun to pass up, is my honest opinion. I'd love to know everyone's thoughts and feelings right now. I mean, Isley is a character who I never would have said in episode one would be like my top tier favorite character. But even though Prontia and Rin, I think, are the biggest badasses, there's something about Isley's mysterious and just psychotic nature that makes him the most fascinating character for me currently. But let me know whatever you're feeling, both character and story-wise, down below. Leave like, the enjoy, and subscribe if you're new around here. So until next time, everyone, please take care and have a good one.